bullpen to call up Andy Pajes. Today's Jackie Robinson Day. We're going to talk Profar versus Will Smith. Are the Padres relevant or irrelevant? All that more here on a jam-packed episode of Dodgers Dugout Live. It's time for Dodger baseball. And that's right three. Dodgers have won it all in 2020. Mookie Betts cranks him. Left field. They're going to make big signings. They're going to make impact trades. I don't care how many times this team rips my heart out, I'll never stop loving the Los Angeles Dodgers. Think blue, bleed blue, and I'm out. What's going on, Dodgers Nation? Welcome to another episode of Dodgers Dugout Live. My name is Doug McCain, credential member of Dodgers Media. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. Now, if you haven't yet, do us a huge favor and subscribe to the Dodgers Nation YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Hit that like button and let us know. On a scale of 1 to 10, what is your concern level right now with the bullpen? Do you think they'll be able to fix it? Of course, we start every show with the Dodgers Dugout Live poll question of the show. I ask you guys over on the X. By the end of the year, the Dodgers bullpen will be, and 14% of you say elite, 36% of you say good, 36 say average, and 14% some doomsday Dodgers right now saying it'll be a dumpster fire. So we're going to break it all down. We're talking about Andy Paez. Should the Dodgers call up Andy Paez sooner than later? But I want to start with Jackie Robinson Day. One of my favorite days of the year in Major League Baseball, and it's a day to see celebrate an American icon, a true legend, someone who transcends what he did on the field, someone who was a Hall of Fame talent, but what he did for the sport, what he did for the country, what he did for the world transcended that. And of course, on this day, back in 1947, Jackie Robinson made his debut for the Dodgers starting at first base. He did go 0 for 3, but that's irrelevant. The Dodgers won the game 5 to 3, and history was made he broke the color barrier and his impact not just on baseball but as a society and someone who really just gave everything and took everything on and was such an absolute warrior on the field and someone who had to endure a lot he just really makes me be proud to be a Dodger fan so really the thing I'm most proud about to call myself a Dodger fan is this is the franchise of Jackie Robinson now if you wonder how the whole idea came about where all the players wear 42. Well, that all started because Ken Griffey Jr. back in 1997, the 50th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier, he called then Commissioner Bud Selig and said, I want to wear 42 to commemorate, to pay tribute to my dad's favorite player, my dad's idol, Jackie Robinson. And Bud Selig said, okay, I like the idea, but let me call Rachel Robinson. Let me see if she'll sign off on it. And Bud Selig, he does that. He talks to Rachel Robinson, and Rachel Robinson tells Bud Selig, why don't all the players wear 42? So that is how it came about, all thanks to Mr. Ken Griffey Jr., my friend, the kid, Ken Griffey. But our comments aren't displaying on the screen but actually they are starting to display on the screen so we got that figured out but do not stop dropping the comments we want all your comments for the seventh inning stretch all your takes on all things dodger baseball i've got my super producer to my left mr antonio looking for all your hot takes all your comments about the los angeles dodgers and first things first let me know where you represent dodgers nation from today we got 42 40 42 42 we got japan to shohei otani we got Mitch Gordon. Bullpen has always been shaky in April, but became solid as the season progressed. And we're still looking. We got the 91030. We got South Pass in the building. But yeah, so first things first, we're going to dive into today was that game yesterday. 14 walks, 14 walks issued by the Los Angeles Dodgers. It was the most in one game for the Dodgers pitchers since 1962. 14 walks, right? Usually you're looking for the seven strikeouts to get the jumbo jacks. Last year was the 10 strikeouts. I thought that we were going to have to go to Jack in a Box and the fans were going to have to give Jack in a Box the Jumbo Jacks yesterday with 14 walks. That's unacceptable. And somehow, some way, the Dodgers were winning that game. Somehow, some way, James Paxton, who issued eight walks yesterday, 
he was able to induce key double plays in certain stretches and only gave up three earned runs in five innings despite walking eight batters. And a lot of that was because he was able to generate some soft contact, get ground ball outs. But it is concerning the fact that James Paxton is primarily a fastball pitcher and you're unable to command it. If you want to if you're relying on your secondary pitches, but this is someone who relies on the fastballs up in the zone with that carry. And unfortunately, he wasn't his best day. And the fact that the bullpen had been so taxed with this kind of unofficial six man rotation where they're making Ryan Yarbo be that bulk guy. Michael Grove getting some multi inning work where, look, you have to go out there and try to get as much length from these guys as you possibly can. But like I said, despite all of that, he was able to to find a way to give up just three runs. I mean, the bottom of the, the top of the fifth inning, after walking Tatis with one out, he got Cronenworth to ground into a double play. So he goes unscathed. And because of that, he comes back out there in the sixth inning. He walked Machado. He walked Profar. And then Ryan Brazier comes in. And it just has not been good for Ryan Brazier. I'm not ready to say he's a one-year wonder or anything like that. I still think he can figure things out. But with Ryan Brazier, I mean, he gave up the big home run on Friday night. I mean, you saw Tatis Jr. He really had his way with the Dodgers this series. And then yesterday, he walks Kim, and then he gets Camposano to ground into a double play. Merrill reached on an infield single to short. So they were unearned runs, but still, Ryan Brazier is supposed to be that fireman. Didn't get the job done Friday. Dave Roberts said after the game he wasn't sharp. He said that he didn't have his best stuff. And then we were seeing yesterday that he's someone that look look you're not going to be put in great situations when you take on that role and he wasn't able to come through but still I think the Dodgers they let this they let that series get away I mean that's a series they could have swept instead they lose two out of three and really the big talk I mean look at yesterday I mean JP Fire Rising, you throw him in a situation where you're hoping that he can get the job done. I mean, they brought him in as a long-term play in 2022 at the Rays. He had a zero ERA in 24 and a third innings. He was phenomenal, but unfortunately, the fastball isn't quite there, and he struggled. I mean, he did not give them a chance to go out there and win. I mean, he walks Bogarts, Tati singled, Cronenworth walked, and then a couple batters later, Profar... Of all people, he doubled to center for a bases clearing double, and that put the Padres up six to three, and that really was the game right there. So yesterday's game was not a pretty one for the Dodgers bullpen, the Dodgers pitching in general. 14 walks. So many walks, my dog was starting to get jealous. I mean, you just cannot have that. They did not deserve to win yesterday. Anytime you walk 14 men, you just don't deserve to win. But I think it really speaks to a bigger problem in that this bullpen hasn't been figured out yet. It's still early in the year. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So it's going to start, though, with my big takeaways from last week. My big takeaways from last week. And, of course, I have to start with the drama. I got to start with Profar. I got to start with Will Smith. Because on Saturday... Profar and Will Smith, there was a little tension, a little dust up after Gavin Stone. He's working on a perfect game. He's working on a perfect game, and they go a little inside, and Profar has an issue with it, and then he's jawing with Will Smith. The bench is clear. Manny Machado running at Dodger Stadium, a rare sight, hustling at Dodger Stadium, a rare sight. You have the benches clearing, just jawing with one another. And yes, Stone was working on a perfect game, so this is a tactic to try to stop his rhythm and try to get him a little uncomfortable. Well, turns out, after the game, Will Smith had really the quote of the year so far. He told David Vasse of AM570 that Profar is pretty much irrelevant. And then the following day, Profar hits that double. But before that, he was mic'd up and was asked about the dust up, the little tension between him and Smith. And here's what Profar had to say. Do you feel relevant? <laughs> <laughs> no, man. I'm, nah, I'm not going to comment on that. You know, I'm just going to play like I did. You did hear about it, though? Yes, I don't remember it. Okay. But I'm not a media guy. I show up out there. And if you saw when he was mic'd up during the game, he kind of walked it back, and he was saying that, yeah, that he was not trying to throw at him. He wasn't trying to walk him. So pretty much Profar pulled a J. Cole, where J. Cole he comes out with the diss 
towards Kendrick and then he feels bad about it, feels remorse, and he just kind of walks it back and then he kind of disappears, okay? So Profar definitely pulling that J. Cole right there. And yes, he did get some revenge. He did get that big double yesterday. But still, Will Smith, of course, is the superior player. Profar, yeah, are you Profar or you Confar? Me, I think I'm Confar as far as how I feel about him as a player. But still, he's a good energy guy for that team. And I think that he helps the rivalry that is emerging. And yes, it is a division rival, right? It's temporary. It's fleeting. It's a little summer fling. It's not a marriage, right? Our rival, our birth rival is the San Francisco Giants. That's it. You could make a case for the Yankees or the Cardinals, but still say what you want. One of my big takeaways is say what you want about whether you consider the Dodgers and the Padres a rivalry. This matchup has more juice than when most teams, if not all teams in Major League Baseball face off. When you consider the cast of characters, when you consider the fan bases and the proximity, San Diego, you got Dodger Stadium South and everything that's happened as far as the Dodgers being the Padres in 2020, the Padres finally slaying that dragon a couple years ago. You don't have to consider a rivalry. It's fine, but it's still by definition a division rival. And on top of that, there's a lot of juice between these two teams. And we've seen so many epic series, so many epic games. So, yeah, I think it's fair to say it is a temporary rival just like it was with the Lakers and the Suns, just like it was with the Lakers and the Kings. It's absolutely one of the most intriguing and compelling matchups right now in Major League Baseball. I don't care if you want to have to say, oh, they're not a rival, that's fine. But still, you tune in, there's an extra edge when these two teams, they face off. And then how about yesterday when this fan, Renee, he catches that Manny Machado, let's take a look at it. Here's the fan, he catches the Manny Machado home run and then he does the switcheroo. That's like the Walmart baseball. And he throws it back. So a pro move, a pro, look at this, let's take a look at it one more time. A pro like, makes the catch. Well done. Impressive. Boom. We see you, dog. We see you reaching in there. There's the Walmart baseball. And he still has the main Machado one. And he thought no one would notice. But unfortunately, he was put on blast by ESPN. A lot of fans saw it. He interviewed during the game. And I know a lot of fans are saying this is Bush League. I know a lot of fans are riding this guy. Look, let him do what he wants, okay? Let him do what he wants. I'm actually not mad about this. I don't think that this tempted the baseball gods to the point where they forced Dodgers pitchers to walk 14 batters or anything like that. And look, it's Manny Machado, and he's out there. These guys are out there. If you do not know that, these guys, I was talking to Zach Campbell in Korea. He told me that Dodgers Stadium has some of the best ball hawks. And what are ball hawks? Those are guys that go to games with the intention of catching home run balls. He was probably trying to catch Shohei Otani's 176th home run, hopefully, after he passes Hideki Matsui. Ends up with a Machado one, does the switcheroo. I mean, for me, I think I just kind of own it at that point of being a little bit afraid of trying to, a little bit afraid of just trying to get Dodgers fans upset. I did like his interview, though, with Buster Only. He said that his wife was mad at him when Buster asked him why. He said, yeah, we don't have enough time in the telecast for that. But I want to ask you, Mr. Producer Antonio, what would you do, you do in that situation? Do you have any, any issue, any issue with the switcheroo? And let me know down below in the comments. Do you guys have any issue with the switcheroo? I mean, I got to admit, I've done that before. I've had a Walmart baseball, a Target baseball, you know, a chance to get a Sean Green, a Matt Camp, Paula Duca home run back in the day. I would have thrown it and switched it, but I don't have a problem with it at all. No, look, here's the thing. If you get the ball, one, it's the moment, right? It's the moment. And two, it's like, what my big fear there is, what if I throw it back and I hit like the center fielder in the head? And I, I mean, my brain always goes like, what's the worst thing that could happen, right? What if I throw it back, it hits like the center fielder in the head, I'm banned from baseball games, I injure a player or something like that. I don't want to see that. And on top of that, you can give it to a kid. You can give it to a fan nearby, okay? If you get that ball, if you throw it back, you throw the real thing back, then look, you're just going to, it's going to get disposed of. So I have no issue with the fan i thought it was hilarious that he did that but i want to know what you guys have to say down below rain delays were horrible roberto were those rain delays or were those just tears from watching the at bats at the bottom of the lineup i mean it it had to have been right i mean something like that oh you call me roberto again <laughs> no it's, his name is roberto oh my bad 
Roberto Hernandez. He says, Ray Rain Days. It's just Quincy. Look, this is that. Um, Shout out, Roberto. Roberto Hernandez. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we haven't seen this many rain delays. We haven't seen as many rain delays in Los Angeles. But let's see what you guys have to say. I got more issues with the bottom of the lineup. Nando, JP Fire Eisen is worse than Kimbrel. Yeah, we haven't even touched on the bullpen. Don't worry, guys. Wait, we absolutely will. Cook Dude got caught. Can't trust. That's from Roberto Hernandez again. And then we got Angel Macias DeBaca. I don't think people should pressure others to throw it back. Look, I mean, it's a fun moment. I'm not mad at it, but here's my take on it. When you catch it, the minute that you catch it, it's your property, it's your ball. You get to do what you want to do with it. So I have no issue. We got, I have a Dodgers Gary Carter jersey. Call up Andy Pajes, please. We'll talk about Andy Pajes. Lots of thoughts on that. Fake fan, not from a rivalry team. Other than that, I understand it's from B920. One eyed dragon, switch it and give the Walmart ball to a kid. Okay. <laughs> I like that. I like that. As long as the kids have, right? Nando. 390 says Eduardo Perez at ESPN hate the Dodgers interesting theory Cole I care more about bullpen struggles than some dude in the stands okay so we'll continue to move forward so with the other big takeaways let's get right into it though the bullpen right now they are a hot mess there is no denying it you know I bring my facts to the fight and the numbers prove that they have started off the season as one of the worst bullpens in major league baseball currently they have a 469 era that's 20th a 475 fib that's 23rd they're not striking out a ton of hitters at 8.01 strikeouts per nine that's 22nd 3.20 walks per nine that's 23rd so basically a lot of these categories that really lead to an elite bullpen the Dodgers are bottom third and you look at early in the season you're missing key bullpen pieces you're missing Bruce Dark Gratterall you're missing a Blake Trinan also the guy that you brought back that was your best reliever down the stretch last season in Ryan Brazier he struggled Ryan Brazier has not looked apart Ryan Brazier I see people on the X saying that he's a one-year wonder I think it's way too premature to put that on him or anything like that but Ryan Brazier just hasn't had the command he hasn't been as effective as he was last season well guess what this time last year Ryan Brazier had an ERA north of seven and Ryan Brazier was struggling. So guess what? He goes to the Dodgers. He turns it on. They make some adjustments. He learns that cutter, throws it to lefties, and he becomes a new pitcher. But he struggled on Friday, gave up those two hits, gave up the home run to Tatis. Before that, he had a couple okay outings, a couple okay appearances. But yeah, Ryan Brazier so far has not looked like that guy that the Dodgers had hoped he would be. And then on top of that, Alex Vesia. Alex Vesia, he has a 25% strikeout rate and a 20% walk rate. The ERA sits at 289. Ignore the ERA. I can tell you from talking to so many scouts, so many people in baseball now, they're not focused on ERA. They're focused on more advanced stuff when it comes to evaluating and assessing bullpen pieces. The FIPS at 679. The walk rate is too high. Also, the most concerning thing about Alex Vesia is the velocity's down. The velocity is down on that fastball. And look, most bullpen pieces are most bullpen pieces are two pitch pitchers, right? But the slider needs to be used more if you're Alex Vesia. Dave Roberts said that after the game in Minnesota, right? And he's going with a fastball primarily that he's not commanding and the velocity's down. So if he makes a tiny little mistake and it's off by a couple of inches left or right, and he leaves it out of the plate, opponents are gonna hit. Opponents are going to make him pay for it. And we saw that. I mean, you saw him give up the single to Merrill back in the extra innings game yesterday you saw him struggle once again and unfortunately it appears like this is the Alex Vesey experience where early in the season he struggles and then all of a sudden he turns it on I mean he comes in there in the eighth it's a a 6-3 game he gives up the single to Merrill walks Bogart struck out Tatis it's like even when he's giving up no runs and make sure we get that super chat and even though when he's giving up no runs he's still kind of grinding out appearances. And I think with Alex Vesia, you really want to see if the velocity can get better, if the command can get better. But I'm starting to have my doubts 
that he's that high leverage lefty, right? That he's that guy you can count on in the postseason. But having said that, I mean, look at look at Tanner Scott, the guy I've been pushing for. It's a 703 ERA, a 47 ERA. I mean, bullpens are just so volatile from year to year. You just don't know what you're going to get from each and every guy. It takes a couple months of the season to truly assess what you have. And the thing about bullpens are they are really one of the groups from a team where you see a lot of change during the season. You see them either sink or swim. We saw that last season. Last year, the Dodgers through June through July, they were one of the worst bullpens in baseball. They were the worst bullpen in the history of this franchise. And they turned that around to be among the game's elite by season's end. Thanks to Ryan Brazier. Thanks to Bruce Dark Gratterall having an elite season, right? The bullpen isn't why the Dodgers lost to the Diamondbacks last season. It was the offense, right? So the bullpen is capable of turning things around. There's a lot of factors that go into that. The fact that pitchers, starting pitchers are ramping up. They're still building up, and you're not seeing as much length, right? I mean, you pulled the plug a little early on Yamamoto, right? You pulled the plug a little early on Tyler Glass now. By midseason, the hope is that your starting pitching can go a little deeper into the game, and you don't tax the bullpen as much. So there's that. And then there's also just you have to use the first part of the season to see who has it, right? Are they going to be a one-hit wonder, or do you have to address those needs? And a few years ago, Andrew Friedman said, he told ESPN, every year going into the year, the bullpen performance is what keeps me up at night. And it's funny because the years that I've had the most confidence confidence is probably the years where we've struggled the most and the years where I've been the most afraid are the years where we've been the best so that is a really good look a really telling insight into what goes into building a bullpen right I mean a couple years ago they traded Pollock for Kimbrell right he was trying to build a snowman Kimbrelsa Dodgers were trying to build a bullpen and unfortunately, things didn't work out. I mean, his struggles were a little overblown. I mean, the fact that he ate a lot of innings and he was able to take those innings away from starters that provided value from that standpoint. But look, I mean, he's hit on the Joe Blantons, the Brandon Moros, and Tony Watson. Friedman's had those successes, also has had the Joe Paratas and the Romos and the Jim Johnsons, right? Sometimes bullpen pieces don't work out. Let's not forget, bullpen guys were failed starters for the most part and from year to year sometimes they just don't have it so the important thing that you need to know about fixing this bullpen right now is that what the Dodgers are doing is they're seeing who is going to be the contributors who are going to be the healthy starters the healthy relievers who are going to be the guys that are going to carry this team this season Craig Kimbrell he was owed 16 million dollars last season two seasons ago they owed him 16 million dollars after the trade he didn't even make the postseason roster so if ryan brazier doesn't perform better they're not married to that right they have shown that they're going to do whatever it takes to put the best bullpen together sometimes it takes some time right if they believe the internal options are there they're going to do that right if bruce dark gratterall comes back healthy for the remainder of the season that's going to be big same thing with blake trinan if daniel hudson can continue to produce like he is he made one bad pitch the other night but for the most part huddy has looked really good the strikeout numbers have been there he's been put out there in high leverage situations against the top part of the order on the opposition and he's performed well but outside of evan phillips and Daniel Hudson, these relievers have really been inconsistent and they haven't been effective every single appearance. So I think what the Dodgers are doing, I think it's pretty simple. I think they're seeing one, which of the veterans, which of these guys can we trust, right? And after we determine that, two, which of the young internal options do we think can be a part of this bullpen? Emmett Sheehan, he's going to be out for quite some time. But when he comes back, do you throw him to the bullpen as someone who is a explosive pitcher, high high intensity four seam fastball one of the best four seam fastballs in the organization then dustin may when he returns kyle hurt what do you do with him so i think that they're going to look at all that and they're going to say okay based on what we have who do we need to go to market and go get and i think that nothing is going to stop them from doing that this time last year they were looking for starting pitching and they don't need that at least at the moment right 
This time last year, you might have wanted to add another bat. Yes, you definitely want to upgrade the bottom of the lineup, but you might have an internal option, Andy Pajes, that can solve that. So I think that you look at this team, the hardest pitch, the hardest positions to acquire, they've done that, right? You're not going to trade for a Shohei Otani during the season. You're unlikely going to be able to get a Teoscar Hernandez, although he was traded from the Blue Jays to the Mariners, which on a contract here is really depressing considering players don't like hitting there. It's one of the worst in Major League Baseball. And then starting pitchers, it's difficult to get aces. And on top of that, if you are able to acquire those players, you have to pay above market value. You have to pay such a premium when it comes to prospect capital that you're overpaying. The Dodgers don't want to do that because you're not going to be able to sustain winning. Like I always say, Andrew Freeman likes to buy the Halloween candy the day after Halloween. We can get a little bit of a discount. So they're going to go to market. They're going to get an, another reliever or two if they need to. And I have all the confidence in the world that they're going to fix this by season's end. The team that you saw yesterday is going to be very different come October. You're not going to see James Paxton get starts in the postseason, most likely, right? You're not going to see JP Fireisen out there in big moments. You're probably not going to see Alex Vesia. So let's calm down and remember that the bullpen is a process, but still right now it's definitely hurting the team. And I think I want to see Kyle hurt. I need to see Kyle hurt become a part of this team in any capacity, whether they want to come up and make him a starter and you have him start games and you move Ryan Yarbrough into that long man role that he's supposed to have because i think they have this unofficial six-man rotation where you're having ryan yarbrough as the bull guy why not let these young guys with options come up and make these starts the landon knacks the kyle hurts that's what i want to see but let me know down below in the comment section what is your take right now on the bullpen me i just don't think that andrew friedman is going to put this much money this much effort in putting together the best roster that he's ever put together and allow the bullpen to hurt his chances in the world series, right? He's going to fix this bullpen. I have all the confidence in the world. And honestly, I'm not mad at the way they're going about it. Look at Josh Hader. If you throw tons of money into bullpen pieces, it's going to backfire and it's going to hurt your chances of signing the Yamamoto's, the extensions to glass nows, the Teoscars, right? Those are the premium items. He likes to shop at Whole Foods at Erewhon when it comes to superstar position players and starting pitchers. When it comes to bullpen pieces, yeah, sometimes it's on the dollar menu. Let's be honest. But the, what, I mean, Joe Kelly gave a $25 million deal to a couple years ago, and he was one of the worst relievers in the sport for a couple years now. But let me know down below in the comment section. For me, on a scale of 1 to 10, my concern level right now is really at a four because they're missing key pieces due to injury, and it's still so early in the season. And three, I just think that you can't compare this version of Andrew Friedman to the one we saw a couple of seasons ago. This is a completely new era, a completely new chapter, someone who's determined, who has gotten word from ownership up top saying, we want to win. They are not going to let bullpen pieces get in the way of a World Series. They are going to address that, and they're going to go as big as they need to go. We got call up Kyle Hurt. That's from Shrish. Mark Pryor is washed. That's from Binky. Pablo Ramos Dodgers are underperforming so far this year. Cheryl's Bush is doing great. Happy for him. Sad for him. D Broder got to admit pro far was relevant last night he still sucks like i said it's okay but don't call back like like i said pro far is the j cole in this situation okay if you're gonna go off on will smith don't next day say oh they weren't trying to hit me they weren't trying to walk me at least stand on business as the kids say we got ronald pasquale our list is better than our lineup we got b guzman our il list is better than our lineup that's from b guzman can ct pitch that's from uh b guzman nando 390 nando no. Lux over Bush. What were they thinking? I mean, real quickly there, I guess we'll just not have the seventh inning stretch and we'll just answer that one right away. The thing about Michael Bush is he plays first base, okay? He was not going to go into a third baseman role for this team. He wasn't going to go into outfield role for this team. He probably was going to be a second baseman for this team. He is a first baseman that is a hit first player. And look, he's having a lot of success early. Let's see how he adjusts when they adjust to him, right? That's going to be the key for him. But honestly, I could not be happier for Michael Bush. I think the organization did him a solid. They got a pitcher in Jackson Ferris that they're high on. They're hoping he can contribute at some capacity and someday. But still, I think that Michael Bush, look, did they make the wrong choice? Only time will tell. It's still early, but 
he was a first baseman, did not have that positional versatility. He was getting older. We got to, yeah, we're still in first place. D-Mac will get better. Max, JP, this team is on pace to win 99 games, and they haven't come close to playing their best baseball. So their best baseball is really a 106 to 110 win team. And that's why I believe right now we got uh, a super chat. Let's uh, zoom in a little more on those ones. I didn't eat my carrots this morning, so my vision isn't that great. Do you guys think that carrots can uh, improve your vision? I mean, I've never seen a, a bunny with glasses. I think it's been debunked. It hasn't been debunked? Okay, so we got to Chris. Told you Bobby would be on it. The info I got, though, is that his elbow had been bothering him for a while. A $5 super chat from Chris. By the way, Chris is like passing down below in the comment section, was telling us about Bobby Miller going on the IL. So definitely tune into the show. You get some nuggets like that. Richard Flores, four ninety nine. The Padres have made this series a total S show. It's their World Series. It's always about them. We're uh, one inside pitch away from a brawl. That's from Richard. It's a fire take. Fire take. It's a fire take. And look, this Padres team, it's their World Series. You know for a fact. I didn't even have to check. I know there was a parade down at Gaslamp. But like I said, they are living for the Dodgers. The Dodgers are a team that they have bigger aspirations and bigger goals. But next big takeaway is... I was a little concerned by what I saw on Friday. And what I mean by that is the Dodgers are just the same old Dodgers when it comes to their approach during certain situations. Yes, you guys know, I always say it, if you want the dub, you've got to slug, right? But situationally, there are times when you have to put the ball in play, lay down a bunt, and... Yes, for the most part, you don't want to give up outs, and that's what this organization believes in. But, I mean, we saw a perfect situation there. Chris Taylor at the plate had been one for his last 30, right? Literally at the bottom of the league when it comes to batting average and strikeout rate. And he's at the plate with a runner on second, the Dodgers trailing 8-7. to seven. You can't let him go up there and swing for the fences and try to hit a walk off and try to get it all back with one swing. No, have him go up there, lay the bunt down, get the runner to third, have him feel good about a productive out. And then you have Miguel Rojas, who's looked a lot better offensively this season at the plate with a chance to hit a sacrifice fly to tie the game. And then Mookie Betts, the ability to go out there and possibly win the game. But when you send Chris Taylor up there, it's almost like John Cena is at second base because they can't see him. They don't acknowledge him. They don't realize that the best thing in that situation is to go up there and try to generate some offense. And I think that it's going to rear its ugly head in the postseason if this is the only approach they're going to have, right? If they don't bring out those other clubs in those bags, right? They don't bring out those other clubs in those bags and just drivers all season long. Well, guess what? Michael King, decent pitcher. You're not going to face all Michael Kings in the postseason. When you go to the postseason, you're facing elite hitters. You're facing elite pitchers. The players are better. That's because they have the best records and the best teams, right? So I've been saying this for years now, and it's something that's a little discouraging because of the player in that situation, considering how much he was struggling. And then two, just the fact that I mean, are we just going to try to do home run derby all day, every day until you win a World Series? Because that's what leads to those droughts that we saw last season. So that, to me, is definitely a concern. The same old Dodgers. I'm going to give that one a, a down. But uh, next one, next next big takeaway, Tyler Glass now is the Dodgers ace. Tyler Glass now is the face of this rotation moving forward. I mean, the performance he had against the Minnesota Twins, he had an 85 game score. That was the second highest one he had posted in his career. He had a 14 strikeout game in 2021. But that was the highest game score by a Dodger since Clayton Kershaw on July 15, 2022 against the Angels, where he went eight strong, had six Ks, was flirting with that perfect game there. And he had 88 pitches. That was 88 pitches. That was the fewest amount of pitches in a start with 14 strikeouts in the wild card era. 
So you're talking about an efficient 14 strikeout game. He could have easily gone out there. And I thought that he was incredible. I really do. And I think that Tyler Glass now, his best baseball is ahead of him. And I think that is a big takeaway from last week. I mean, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, you want to see him be a little more efficient earlier in starts. Kind of takes him a, a little while to get the feel for all of his pitches. And the pitch count, you're starting to see kind of climb up there early in starts. Glass now is the guy. Like I said, the injuries, that's behind him. How is Glass? then this is glass now tyler glass now too he was on a podcast with uh with chris rose and he was asked about all the injury stuff and he said you know what i gotta throw 97 because if i don't throw 97 i'm not gonna be effective he thinks the risk is worth it to go out there and pump 97 to 100 so i'm not mad at that now to read your comments and i'm going to talk about andy pajes andy pajes dave roberts is a Bench coach at best. That's a that's a finish. Him. Him. We got Justin Lombus. Sheehan will be out for the year, I believe. We'll see. We'll see. I'm gonna try to catch up with him. Going to the game later. Dave doing Dave stuff. BC Victor Gonzalez, a one five ELA Ray for the twelve and four Yankees, a lefty. Yeah, it makes you wonder. Did they give up the wrong lefty with Ferguson? I mean, Ferguson hasn't had that much success. Victor Gonzalez, they were kind of done with him, but I think the option is externally. I truly believe that. Um, Dave equals a glorified cheerleader. 1K, eight walks is pretty bad. That's from NS. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about too many walks. Thank you for this, DMAC. I need this conversation last night. Yeah, I mean, we'll be back uh, on the Sunday post game show next week for sure. Curse shouldn't see a postseason start. Bullpen, yes, BC. But the bottom of the lineup didn't help. Yeah, the bottom of the lineup has been bad. There's no doubt about it. And I think that's another area where you're looking at the Dodgers to address. We got a super chat from Keanu Reeves. Angel fans at my job believe in Otani's bed conspiracy. Oh, my goodness. You know, just give them a nice tinfoil hat. Tell them all kinds of wild conspiracy theories for sure. Exactly. DMAC, what up, David? Brazier fooled us last year. Not that good. Vargas for Lux. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is Andy Pajes. Andy Pajes is absolutely killing it at the minor league level. I mean, he's raking so far. He's been absolutely dominant. And he's just putting up crazy numbers. Putting up crazy numbers. And you're seeing the strikeout rate really impressive and he has an ops of 11 46 he's right an eight game hitting streak he had three hits had in drove in four runs yesterday i mean andy pahez is killing it andy pahez is ahead of schedule at this point a lot of people said okay coming off that injury you want to see more at bats for pahez and yes you do Anytime you get a young player that's still trying to prove himself, you want to give him consistent at-bats. But I just don't see how you can justify having Chris Taylor in there over Andy Pajes if Chris Taylor doesn't turn things around in the next couple of weeks. And Pajes is someone who is 23 years old. He just looks and feels like an elite big league hitter already. And it's going to take some time. He's not going to come up here. We're not going to see a Puig mania. But he has a 178 weighted runs created plus. He's seeing 371. And the most impressive thing to me is that strikeout rate is at 17.8%. So you're talking about someone that can hit home runs, but does not have to sell out for power, does not have to strike out a ton just to get those home runs. And let's be honest, the Dodgers need some pop. They need some life at the bottom of the lineup. If it's not Andy Pajes, which it won't be Pajes first, it's going to be Miguel Vargas before him. I think Miguel Vargas also deserves that opportunity. But do you have those internal options that you can go to? Okay, you don't put together the farm system that you have and pour these resources into them unless you're going to go out there and have these guys play for you, either play them or trade them. You guys know what we say, prospects parades over prospects right in this one i want to see this prospect and see if he can be that guy that can bring life to the bottom of that lineup and like i said if it's not andy pajes miggy vargas is hitting 302 with a 147 weighted runs created plus he has three home runs so there's two guys down at the minor league level and miguel vargas and andy pajes that really should get an opportunity because the thing about Chris Taylor, it's not like he's playing any infield positions, right? It's more of a break in case of emergency for him there. And if you're just going to have the outfield spot occupied, then look, let's see what you have, right? I think you have to do it sooner than later because you want to see 
if Miguel Vargas and Pajes can hit at this level and do anything close to what they're doing down in AAA, then that's going to change what you do at the trade deadline. But if you don't see what you have in those guys now in a little mini audition, by the time the trade deadline rolls around, you can't bank on either of those two guys coming up and contributing after the trade deadline. So let's say you're saying, okay, let's get Andy Pa has those at bats. Let's see if he can be that guy and give him some more experience. And then we'll call him up at some point during the summer. Okay, sure. Well, let's do that. And then what happens? Well, what if he's bad? What if he's not there yet? And then the trade deadline rolls around and you want another bat at the bottom of the order. And then you're kind of late to the party there, right? So I think from an evaluation and assessment standpoint, this gives you an opportunity to go out there and say, you know what? Let's let it fly. Let's go and see what we can do with some of these young guys and see if they can be contributors because Jason Hayward's out. We'll see what they get from him this season. But here's a good thing too. With the versatility, I was talking to my good friend, Tim Rogers about this, the versatility of Teoscar Hernandez and Mookie Betts, that allows you some flexibility to say, maybe we can find that external bat at the bottom of the lineup as an infield piece or as an outfield piece, right? It could be a Tyler O'Neill, or someone like that if he becomes available. But I asked Dave Roberts about Chris Taylor a couple days ago and his struggles, and here's what Dave had to say. And Dave, you got Chris Taylor starting at left tonight. He's gone up to a little bit of a slow start. What have you seen from him so far? Is he fully healthy? Do you think he needs more to be more consistent at bat? Just kind of what's your overall assessment so far of Chris Taylor? Um, he, he's uh, he's scuffling certainly. Um, I think you know in spring training in, in Seoul, I thought he was swinging the bat really well. Um, so he's a guy that you know is one of our core guys, and obviously with the injury to Jason. I have some more runway to run him out there and run Kiki out there to get him some at bats. And, um, you know, he expects a lot of himself. And, you know, every time he gets in there, I feel something good's going to happen. Um, so hopefully, you know, he's, he's, just, he's always been a streaky guy. And um, so hopefully that, you know, it'll stop tonight and he can kind of find something that clicks for him. But, uh, you know, I'm trying to give him some runway um, as well as Kike while Jason's down. I think right now he, he's healthy, he's strong, and uh, there's nothing about the body uh, for me that's being detrimental. So there you go. Dave said it right there. He's healthy and he's strong. So if that's the case, unless he goes up there and he swings or a ball hits him in the wrist or something like that, you can't use that phantom IL. It's getting more dangerous to try to do that. Do you find some way to send him on the IL and he can try to fix his swing? You send him down to Camelback Ranch and see if he can really get things right. Maybe he's someone that just needs a complete reset at the moment and then you can try to fine tune some things i think for me it's just adapt or die with chris taylor i mean you're seeing the load the big looping swing kind of swinging underneath some stuff does that translate now when you lose a little bit of that bat speed right i mean when you lose a little bit of that twitch and you get a little older i think you have to flatten out that bat path and get a little more contact oriented but he still is trying to be 2017 chris taylor and there's just a lot of boom and bust in there and i think in years past it's like okay maybe not but Andy Pajes is sitting around. And just ask yourself this question. If Chris Taylor went to the plate today and Andy Pajes went to the plate today against the Washington Nationals, who would you feel better about getting a hit? I mean, uh, Andy Pajes could be a special hitter, right? And I think after what we've seen with Michael Bush having the success that he's having the Chicago Cubs, clearly the Dodgers are starting to hit on these prospects. So I absolutely, I don't think now's the time, but sooner than later for Andy Pajes, sooner than later when it comes to a Chris Taylor decision. I mean, are they going to DFA him? I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's a little premature to say that someone who is just such a big part of this Dodgers community, he's done a lot of incredible things off the field he's beloved by his teammates he's a leader there and yeah he's one for 32 to start the season with 17 strikeouts it's not like it's a chris davis 0 for 54 in 62 i pulled a chris davis when i was asked for prom dates from back in 2000 whatever but i mean look he's got to adapt right i don't think they're going to dfa him but would there be a situation where you kind of do right by him you trade him to a team pay off some of that pay down some of that salary Maybe that's an option, but still, he's got to produce at some point or the Dodgers have to look elsewhere. And look, it's not the reason why they're losing or anything like that, but still, it's a glaring need. Even Kike's struggle. I mean, James Alman hit a couple home runs in the Minnesota series, but they're just not getting enough production at the bottom of the lineup. Mookie Betts is eighth on the team in plate appearances with runners on. 
You saw a couple days ago on Saturday, got some opportunities because Gavin Lux was able to get on base. He got two singles. So you need more from the bottom of this lineup. And I think that's going to be something they're going to focus on is what do we do down here? But Andy Pajes, keep saying that name, keep manifesting it. This has to be the year from Pajes. Now, quick one on Emmett Sheehan. Dave Roberts said that Sheehan has been shut down from throwing following a little setback that he had. And Dave said it's a, quote, longer situation for him. So big takeaway there is, yeah, you just kind of have to hope that he can find some way to get back on the mound because he's a big piece to this team. Internally, he's one of those guys where when other teams call for trades, He's one they don't include. That's how high they are on Emmett Sheehan because they know he's got that explosive force here that plays up in the postseason. We'll see when they can get him back. But that definitely throws a wrench in the Dodgers' plan. But my big takeaway there is this is Gavin Stone's opportunity to take this opportunity, run with it, and solidify himself for L.A., right? You can set himself in stone in this rotation. And he looked really good. He was flirting with a perfect game, trusting his stuff in the zone. And I think we're going to be seeing Landon Knack. I think Robleski. I think Robleski is someone that's probably going to get an opportunity too. I think some of these younger guys that we didn't anticipate seeing as early as we possibly are, you got to, hey, keep, keep uh, your bags packed, right? Don't be buying houses down there. Don't, uh, you know, keep everything packed. Keep that cell phone handy because I think that some of these young guys are going to get opportunities earlier than we've seen. I think you're going to have to have Yarbrough and Michael Grove step up and eat some innings, especially with Bobby Miller out. So that definitely is something that has really thrown a wrench in the Dodgers' plans is the injuries to Emmett Sheehan and Bobby Miller. But final thought today, final thought today is that – can we just accept the fact that the Padres are always going to be a little brother and that, yes, if they want to make this a rivalry, it's fine. I was reminded of the J, the J, Justin Turner and Joe Musgrove situation a few years ago where he said that he wasn't a threat and that Justin Turner just owned him from then on out. He had a great season from that point on. But people out there, the Padres fans, like, it's relevant, 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 relevant. Oh, uh, Jerks and Profar is relevant, relevant, relevant. Okay, you know what I think was relevant was the fact that J.P. Fireisen was out there throwing 91-mile-per-hour meatballs in the middle of the plate, right, than anything else. Okay, so it's your World Series Congratulations. You took two of three from the Dodgers. You split in Korea. But guess what? I'm not worried about who's relevant now in April. I'm worried about who's relevant in October. And I think after it's all said and done, let's not forget. This is the show GM, the Shohei Otani era of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Saint the in the past. They are not going to be pinching pennies and be afraid to address needs at the trade deadline. They are all the way in on this team. And yeah, fine. Padres, you're relevant now. The Dodgers, they're relevant now and they will be relevant in October. But that's going to do it for this episode of Dodgers Dugout Live. I'm going to be at the stadium for Jackie Robinson Day. So be on the lookout for content over on Dodgers Nation Twitter. On our Instagram, we'll be dropping a video at the game. Let's do some walk-off shots, though. Some walk-off shots here down below in the comment sections here. What you guys have to say a couple more here. We got uh, some super chats here. Francisco Diaz, DMAC, it's time to call it Pajes and or play Vargy in left field. Taylor has been an automatic out. And even if they produce slightly better results, at least the kids will be able to have time to develop. And yeah, there's no currency like experience, right? You can't put a price on experience. So I agree with you. Smith went from the quiet rookie to all out dog. Uh, Smitty is a dog. Smitty has that grit. That's my Dodger catcher for life. And he ain't taking nothing from nobody jerks in pro far okay dmac what would be your lineup right now i mean honestly you probably would if, if right now i gotta get crazy with it i truly would early in the season i would call up andy pahez yesterday okay and i would try to call miguel vargas yesterday possibly and, and give these guys an opportunity early on the season when everyone's trying to figure things out but really outside of that i mean the top six is still producing teoscar hernandez max muncie will smith those guys are producing i've heard people out there saying you want to throw gavin lux in the two hole instead of an otani to try to lengthen the lineup Hell no. Hell no. What are you talking about? Okay. <laughs> you want to give these guys as many at bats as you possibly can and give them the best pitches that they can to do damage. Let me just tell you this. I, look, I've watched baseball my entire life, right? 
I've never seen someone effortlessly slug like Shohei Otani. I've never seen someone make slugging look so easy. Look, I mean, you only truly get to experience a player when he's on your own team. I truly believe that. He's the best hitter I've ever seen as far as just doing damage. And he hasn't even really hit his top gear yet. Uh, this guy's incredible what he's able to do. It just sounds different. It sounds like a shotgun going off when he hits the baseball. I could be blinded and I could hear Otani home run. I could point it. That's the Otani home run there. It's absolutely incredible. So, yeah, we got uh, Mr. Henry Moya. Jerry Dave didn't lose the game. He didn't tell the pitcher to walk 14 batters. Yeah, look, I mean, if you're going to pin everything on Dave Roberts at this point, I mean, it's kind of exposing a lot of things. I mean, I think the thing with Dave Roberts – I mean, you had Paxton go back out there when probably I would have liked to see a fresh reliever, especially after all the walks. But his hands are definitely tied right now with the availability of some of these guys. So I think there's that. But, yeah, guys, we'll do a longer show tomorrow because i got to head to the stadium right now. But thanks again for rocking with us here on Dodgers Dugout Live. If you have not yet, do us a huge favor a huge favor and subscribe to the Dodgers Nation YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, hit that like button. That really helps out the channel and comment down below, comment down below. So you're eligible for all the giveaways. So definitely, definitely be sure to do that. By the way, special shout out to super producer Antonio to my left. He's always looking for your comments and we'll hit some of these comments to start the next show, but end on a little Jackie Robinson quote, a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. Jackie Roosevelt Robinson. You should be so proud to be Dodgers fans. The fact that just one of the most iconic sports figures ever play for this historic legendary organization but that is going to do it alex Renteria paxton will be moved to the bullpen come postseason that's what i said the day they signed him right i mean i think it's something that if he performs like he's capable of that's definitely going to be an option but that is going to do it guys get talk dodger baseball to you all day every day but my name is doug mccain you can follow me on x and instagram at dmac underscore la remember nothing brings us together quite like dodger baseball and until next time think blue bleed blue